Well, how many of you, well, I won't have you raise your hands, but I bet there are a lot of you that have witnessed a child learning to walk. I'm just going to guess. Any of you who've had children, of course, you've seen that. But even if you haven't had children, you've probably <coughs> witnessed at least part of that process of a child learning to walk. And it's quite a thing, isn't it? We take walking for granted if we're used to it. Uh, we don't even think about it. I can pace around while I talk to you. And uh, I don't even think about how complicated of a task walking is. Uh, it really is. Whether you're young and don't know how to walk, or whether you're facing a disability and you're no longer able to walk, or even if for a temporary period of time, maybe you had an injury and you weren't able to walk, you know how complicated walking is. And yet we can learn such a complicated task and then do it without even thinking about how much we're trying to stay on balance the entire time. Well, for a child learning to walk, this is all new. And so uh, generally when a child learns to walk, they start off being a little bit safer. So they walk around the perimeter of the room holding on to things to help them keep their balance. Because if they let go, they're going to fall, right? But then as they do that for a while, they're holding on to things for balance, then eventually they, they venture off into the great unknown. And they walk away from the perimeter. And they, they fall, right? I mean, they, they're kind of wobbly and toddly, and that's why we call them toddlers, and then eventually they fall down. But regardless of the child, they eventually try again. Now, some may try right away. They might get up and try right away. Others, depending on their personality, they might wait a while. They may say, this isn't for me. But eventually, they're going to try again. And as they continue to try, they will go greater distances until eventually, by golly, they can go longer and longer without falling until they hardly ever fall at all. And as they grow older, they get steadier, so they're not as wobbly and toddly, and they, they, grow, they uh, walk pretty quickly until pretty long they're scooting around the entire house. And then, eventually, they get to where they don't even have to think about it. They just walk, and it's very simple. That's a good metaphor for us as we think about our faith, because so often we think of our faith as being like a status. I am a Christian, I'm not a Christian. Now we think of it as a status, or maybe a to-do list. Well, I got baptized, and I got confirmed, and I uh, went to church, and I went to a Bible study, I served on this committee, I got my kids baptized, I made sure my kids got confirmed, and you can go on down the list of a checklist faith. But what if faith is more than a checklist? What if faith is a process or a journey? If faith is more of a journey, then there must be steps along the way or directions. There must be a destination. And so if we are on a journey, then we need to know what that destination is because there's no point in going anywhere if we don't know where we're going. Uh, if I'm going to use my GPS to go somewhere, I have to know where I'm going, right? If I, uh, punch, I have to punch in an address or I at least have to punch in the city because if I don't put something in there, it's not going to go know how to get there. It's not going to be able to tell me the steps. And so you have to know where you're going if you're going to go on a journey. And so a good question to ask is, where is the destination for our journey of faith? Where are we going? What is, the, what is the goal of faith? We talked about it a little bit in past months, the goal of our faith, but I want you to think of it as kind of a destination. And so if you go to the next slide, uh, the, and if you can read that, the words are a little small, but if we think about our faith, the key aspect of a Christian or a follower of Christ is somebody whose life is like Christ. We're trying to emulate or imitate Christ in our own lives. And so the more we are like Christ, the more mature we are in our faith. And so therefore a disciple, which basically disciple means student. So a student or a follower of Christ is somebody whose life is centering on loving God and loving others. That comes from the greatest commandments. When uh, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all of the 613 commandments in the Old Testament? 
Uh, he said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the next one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, love others. That's how you sum that up. So a life that's centering on loving God and loving others, this definition comes from a Bible study called A Disciple's Path that was written by a retired United Methodist minister by the name of James Harmish. And I like to use that because it really sums up the Christian life if you had to sum it up in a sentence. The goal or the destination is to be centering on loving God and loving others. Now notice it's centering, not centered. That's because the goal is always out there. You know, we can get closer to it. But the idea that somebody can stop growing, the idea that somebody could say, well, I'm done, is silly. You know, we can always be along the process. We can be working on centering our lives on loving God and loving others. But if anybody would say, yep, yeah, my life, I'm there. My life is centered on loving God and loving others all the time. <clears throat> well, chances are they're not. But because they're, they're uh, usually... People who are getting close to there, they would never say they are, you know. And so it's a process, and it's a process that we go through all the time. And it involves our beliefs and our actions, right? If, if it's just our beliefs, if we're just growing in what we believe about God, then we can become really pious, and we can become really uh, kind of to where we feel holier than other people. But if it doesn't also involve our actions then it's not going to result in true change. And the same is true the other way around. Just action, if it's not followed also by what we believe, then our actions are groundless. And so true transformation happens in our lives. True growth happens in our lives when it affects our intellect and our heart, when it involves action and belief. So that's the goal or the destination of our faith. And you can go ahead and go up to the next slide now. Uh, so the, the destination of our faith, don't worry, I don't expect you to read that. But uh, the, the destination is to have a life that's centering on loving God and loving others. So if there's a destination, we have to know how to get there. How do I get from point A to point B? I can't just wake up one morning and say, this is the day that I am going to be centered on loving God and loving others. You better just not get out of bed if that's the case because you have more of a chance of being successful. But probably something's going to happen in the day that's going to make you not be focused on just loving people or loving God. So, you know, we can't just flip a switch. There's a process there. And it's, it's a slow process, it is, but there is a path to get there, right? If you're on a journey and there's a destination, there's got to be a path to get there. And so I like to think of it as like different relationships that we have in our life. And if you want this in paper form, uh, we can hand that for you in paper form. But basically, what it has is it just has five different types of relationships that we have with people. And most everybody, we have different kinds of relationships with people that differ depending on how close we are with them. So it goes stranger. Well, it's a little bit different, but yeah, in the parentheses, it's very small. Stranger. Acquaintance, friends, good friends, and intimate friends. And most people have uh, relationships with people in all these categories. So the first one is a stranger, and that's easy. A stranger is a person you don't know. So a, a person is someone you meet that you don't know beforehand. And when you are passing a stranger on the sidewalk or somewhere, you may or may not say hi. It depends on the situation. You might say hi, and oftentimes in nowadays in our culture, if you say hi to somebody you don't know, then you probably won't say hi back because they're going to be a little bit surprised, first of all, that you said hi to them even though they didn't know you or you didn't know them. And they might think, how am I supposed to know this person? They said hi to me. I don't remember if I know them. And because generally, we only say hi to people we know. But saying hi to strangers can be nice, too. And so you might or may not say hi to them depending on the situation. You might feel a little bit anxious or apprehensive depending on what time of day it is, where you're at. Uh, the situation can vary. And so you might actually feel uncomfortable with a stranger, especially if you're alone. And so when we think about the stranger, if we think about our faith, a person's faith when they're just starting out, 
they would consider God to be probably like a stranger. You know, if you didn't grow up in church, or maybe you did, but you don't really go anymore, and you don't really, you wouldn't say you necessarily believe in it, and you're just, honestly, when you think about God, and you think about maybe going to a church, you, you just feel apprehensive or nervous. And so that's kind of the, you could call it the ignoring stage, but basically you just, you don't, God is a stranger. God is a foreign concept to you. You are not like spending your time thinking about God. Now, the next one is an acquaintance. Now, an acquaintance is a little bit different. You know who an acquaintance is. You might not even know their name, but you know who they are, at least by their face. And so an acquaintance might be somebody, a cash register, a fairway, or high bee that you see on a semi-regular basis when you go shopping there. Honestly, for many of, uh, of you, most of the other people in church would be acquaintances. I know we like to think that everybody knows everybody in the church, but oftentimes the reality is that, you know, we have some friends in church, but then a lot of the people in church, we know them, we might know their face and their name and some very basic information about them, but let's face it, for a lot of the people in the church, they would be considered acquaintances. You know who they are, that's about it. So we are a little more at ease with acquaintances because they're not strangers. And when we think about our faith, growing in our faith with God, it says this is kind of the exploring stage. So you're getting to know God. You don't know God very well or, or the faith or what it's all about, but you're at least a little bit more familiar with it. Maybe you're going to church once in a great while and you're just kind of exploring, but you're not quite sure. And then there's the third one, friends, in the middle there. It says getting started. So uh, friends are people that you know, you know better than an acquaintance. You maybe spend time with one another outside of an obligation. You, uh, you share more with one another. Now, you don't share everything. You know, there's certain levels, and, and you, you go below the surface level, but you don't share everything with all of your friends. And so a friend in the faith, if you think about God as a friend, it says getting started. I believe in Jesus. I'm working on what it means to follow him. And I'm participating in the life of the church. So maybe at this point is when we would consider a new Christian. Somebody who has decided they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, and they are going to try to follow Jesus. But they're still kind of exploring and not sure exactly what that all means. Uh, but they're, they're trying to plug in to God, so to speak, in any way that they can. Now, you all know that we have different levels of friends, right? You have your friends, and you probably have a larger number of friends than you do good friends. Good friends are people that you can go deeper with. You trust them more, you're closer to them. Jesus had his disciples, but he had three who were part of his inner circle that he was closer to. And uh, in the same way, you probably have some friends that you're closer to than others. You trust them more than you do some of the other friends. And you would tell them things you wouldn't necessarily tell everyone. And so in our faith, if in that stage, in the fourth stage, we're going deeper. So my relationship with Jesus makes a difference in how I live my life. So it's starting to actually make a difference outside of church. And uh, I'm discovering how my life can make God's love real in the world. So we're still, we're still growing and then finally, the last one is intimate friendship. Now, an intimate friend is somebody that you trust with everything. There's nothing that you need to keep with this person. There's no level of yourself. You can open up your heart to this person. It could be a spouse, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be. It could just be a friend who you're, you're so close to that you can trust with anything. You, those are rare. You don't find very many, of, many friends of this type of level in your lifetime. So when you do, they're uh, very precious. And in our faith, and this is kind of the highest level. So it says centering. Uh, following Jesus is the most important thing in my life. My life is part of God's transformation of the world. And that's kind of the goal of where we're headed. So maybe already you can kind of identify yourself with somewhere along that spectrum. Maybe you can find yourself fitting into a couple of those different things depending on the day. But uh, maybe you can kind of see where you're at and that can kind of help. But uh, we, we continue to grow in our faith and we need to do it 
in the next several weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to look at different habits of people who are mature in their faith, things that we can do to help us to grow. Because the thing is, we want to be intentional about growing in our faith. Unintentional faith development doesn't work very well. Can you imagine if you went to college? See, here's how college works. You go to college and you major in something. And usually that has to do with what you want to be when you grow up, when you get out of college, what kind of job you want to have. And you major in something, and you hope that by the time you graduate, you have the credits and the requirements to be able to enter into the workforce. And of course, we know real life, you don't always end up working in a place, you, at the type of field you majored in, but at least you have the credits and you have the capabilities that you, you, know, you have all the prerequisites. And in college, you have an advisor who kind of tells you what classes you need to take. They give you the pathway or the process or the map to make sure you get everything met. Now, at first, you have the gen eds that, you know, everybody has to take, but then it becomes more specialized. Well, imagine if you went to college and there were no advisors. Or imagine they, they were, you did have an advisor, but your advisor said, eh, it doesn't really matter. Just take what looks good. Just take whatever classes you want to and you'll be okay. Well... If left to your own devices, you might take some classes that are in your field, but you know, oh, I'm interested in this, and I'm interested in that. So you might get some of them, but you probably won't be ready to have a degree in the major that you want to have. We have to be intentional. And in the same way, in church, sometimes unintentional faith development looks like, well, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to take uh, this random study here, and I'm going to do this thing here, and... Uh, you know, we pick things, and sometimes the church is guilty because the church offers things that are really random and, and just kind of here and there and everywhere. But we don't necessarily have an intentional plan. The church doesn't necessarily have an intentional plan. You don't necessarily have an intentional plan. Maybe you didn't even know you needed an intentional plan because you didn't have an advisor that told you that there was a journey. And what happens is a lot of times... There are people, believe it or not, there are people who go to church for decades but have not grown in their faith in those decades going to church. That's because no matter how good a sermon may be or a worship service may be, listening and watching can only get you so far. I can watch people run <coughs> all I want, and I can watch them run great distances. I can watch people run a half marathon or a marathon. I'm going to lose zero calories doing that. I could get a membership to the fitness center and I could go watch people lift weights. They might get creeped out, but I could watch them. <laughs> I could even, uh, you know, pay attention to things that you're supposed to do, things you're not supposed to do, the safe ways to lift and, and unsafe ways and, and what's best and how do you... How do you uh, work your your leg muscles, your arms, your upper body, your lower body? How do you? I, I can learn about all kinds of techniques and all kinds of methods, but I'm not going to build any muscles doing that because at some point I have to uh, get beyond just watching and listening and studying, and I have to actually pick up some of the habits of fit people if I am going to start to be fit. And in the same way, in our faith. I can watch and I can listen all that I want to sermon after sermon and I can do all these things, but, and I can study all I want. I can study my entire life. I can study the Bible. I can read it. I can know it in and out. I can, I can do all these things, but eventually if I am going to be spiritually fit, I need to pick up some of the habits of spiritually fit people. And so in the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these spiritual habits or spiritual disciplines, uh, prayer, Bible study, uh, worship, uh, small group uh, participation, uh, financial generosity, uh, sharing our faith in a non-off-putting way, uh, things that people do, and these are proven ways to help us to grow in our faith, but until we pick them up, and maybe we don't even know how to pick them up. Maybe we don't even know how to do these things or how to get started. Because it can be overwhelming. Just like learning an exercise program can be overwhelming, learning some of these spiritual habits can really be overwhelming without some kind of help. And so we're going to look at some of these things. 
and we're going to see how it is that we can grow in our faith. Now go ahead and go to the next slide. We have the next one. Thank you. Uh, we've had a discipleship pathways team that's been working pretty much <clears throat> throughout this entire year of 2018 trying to come up with a pathway. So as we talk about faith as being like a journey, uh, we need a pathway or a map to help us along the way. And so next week you'll have in your bulletin a hard copy of this so you can actually read it. But I always hate to give too many inserts in the bulletin because it can overwhelm you. So we'll give it to you next week. But there are three main pillars to our discipleship pathway that we've worked together on. And that is connect, grow, and serve. Three things. Connect refers to building relationships with one another and with God. That's kind of the what we do when we first are established in the faith. Uh, now for those that are new, uh, maybe they're visitors attending the church, uh, they're not members and they're just started coming, uh, it says, you know, at the very beginning there it says that you begin with a membership class, which we're actually having a membership class this Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, this is a class where people can learn about the mission and vision of the church, what we're about, a little bit about our history, and what's expected of members. And it doesn't obligate a person to join the church. They can attend just to learn that stuff, and they don't have to join. You can be and attend that class even if you are a member, and just if you want to learn some of that stuff or be reminded of some of it. But it doesn't obligate you to join, but it's just kind of a first step. <coughs> and then after that, you know, we, we encourage forming connections with people in the church. Uh, whether it be through foundational classes where we learn some of the basics of our faith, or whether it be through ongoing groups like UOW or uh, other small group uh, studies. But we need to get to know each other. And then we also want to grow in our faith because church is not just about fellowship and it's not just a social club, but we also want to be growing deeper in our faith. And then finally, we want to serve. We want to be able to uh, stop consuming but also produce. We want to serve others in ministry. So those three things, and the reason why there are arrows going back and forth is that we are never really done doing any of those things. The problem is for many churches is that what we find is that when you first start going into church, you make connections with other people, but then at a certain point, you stop making connections with other people because you have enough, right? I mean, we all have a capacity for a certain amount of connections, so eventually you have enough connections. And then what happens is that when new people come to church, they have nobody to make a tech connection with because everybody already has connections. And so we always want to be open to making connections with more people. And I'm an introvert when I'm saying this, okay? So for the introverts in the congregation, I feel you. I know how you feel. But, you know, but, uh, you know, forming connections with people is important as an ongoing process. We also always want to be growing in our faith. We always want to be serving. So we'll talk about that in further detail in, in, in the weeks ahead. But I just wanted to introduce that to you. This is something we hope to kind of implement in 2019. But the key is that when you grow in your faith, yes, there's a map, there's a pathway, but it's going to look different for everyone. We're all at different places along the way. Some of us, we may consider God kind of like an acquaintance. Some of us, we may say God is a good friend. We're in different places along the way. And that's fine. That's wonderful. But the key is to, to be able to identify kind of where you are and what the next steps may be. And our hope is that as a church, we can help you to do that. So may we continue as we go through these next several weeks and we look at these habits. May you be encouraged to not just watch and listen and study, but ultimately to pick up the habits and to be intentional in becoming more like Christ.